you know, I find some really intelligent, interesting people who are doing what they can to do what they love, but you can't ignore the business side of it. And, and so they struggle with that. This is episode 96. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Helping architects conquer the world. What does that mean? Not quite sure, but it has something to do with, you know, doing your best every single day. Welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is a show where we sit down with successful architects, designers, business thought leaders like we have on the show today to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today we're joined once again by Todd Redding, the Chief Operations Officer and Vice President for Investments of Shred Venture Group. Support for today's show is provided by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and product management software built specifically for architects. You can also get two free seats of this software for free if you're a startup firm. You can do that over at ArchiOffice.com. You can sign up for a demo. So. Uh, go check it out if that sounds interesting. Now, also, I want to thank those of you who signed up for more information on the 150.015 project. Kind of a tongue twister there even for me. But my goal here this year at Business of Architecture is to up the ante in terms of the way that this particular effort in my life is affecting architects around the world. So I want to influence 150 architects in 2015. I have something in the works. To find out more about it, go visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash 150. So with that, I'd like to welcome back Todd Redding, the Chief Operations Officer of Charette Venture Group, back to the show. Welcome back, Todd. Thanks, Enoch. Thanks. It's good to have you back on here. Now, last time we, we talked a little bit about Charette Venture Group. Would you just give us a, an overview of what Charette Venture Group is once again for those that didn't catch the last episode? Yeah, sure. We, uh, we have started a new uh, investment company that's looking to invest in small to mid-sized architecture firms uh, and help them achieve growth uh, and benefit from that growth, profit from that growth, so to speak. That's just a radical concept. I mean, when I hear it, it just sounds exciting. You know, it just sounds totally interesting. And uh, it was the brainchild of Matt Ostanek, correct? Correct. Or can Austin, you tell me how this, uh, Ostanek, yeah, can you tell me a little bit more about how this came about? Sure. Well, Matt uh, is an architect by trade. He, uh, he practiced architecture right out of school, went to Iowa State University. Um, he saw a need in the marketplace for, uh, for the exchanging of submittals and documents and so forth. And he actually started Submittal Exchange, uh, which over about 10 years he grew from, from completely a dream to what now has uh, more than 100 employees. He sold that company um, to a larger company that he stayed on uh, to work for for a couple of years. They went through an IPO. And then uh, at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, Matt uh, left that to start a couple of new ventures that he's been excited about. And he always has had uh, this passion uh, for architecture. He continues to be a licensed architect today. And uh, so he, he founded Charette Venture Group to try to really uh, impact the field of architecture and bring uh, many of the lessons he learned through running, building and running a software company you know, into architectural practices. And how do both of you see the Charette Venture Group as impacting the practice of architecture? Well, we're just getting started, um, but you know, we feel like right now we're impacting it by learning and listening as much as we possibly can. Um, we've we've been talking with as many architects as who will talk with us in that small to mid-sized space and asking about their their lives, how they started their firm, what their challenges have been, uh, what tools they're using today, what their vision for the future is. And from those conversations, it's helping us gain, you know, a real base of knowledge that we intend to use eventually when we're ready and we find a firm that would, would like to do business with us and we'd like to do business with them. We can bring to the table a whole set of uh, best practices, resources, even capital, uh, and help them uh, transition out of that small space uh, even into that mid-sized space. So, Todd, you said in, in this research phase, last, last uh, episode we talked a little bit about um, the firm culture. It being a challenge in some architecture firms and some of the disadvantages or advantages of not having that really well figured out. Um, what other challenges have you seen? I know that you have, uh, the another thing we talked about was outsourcing the bookkeeping 
was something you mentioned, outsourcing some of those tasks that firms find. Uh, that's challenging. I know you have your notes there in front of you from these interviews that you've taken. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else there you'd like to bring up and share with us about challenges? Uh, yeah, I can tell you a couple of, a couple of things that, that I've heard that are, that are in my notes here that I kind of found interesting. I asked one, one uh, gentleman, and if uh, if running a business was what he expected, and he kind of laughed, and he looked up and he said, "You know, I, I didn't know I was going to be a slave to cash flow." <laughs> mm. so people need to understand that they have to engage the business challenges of running a firm. What did he mean uh, by that? Could you take us in the head for those who aren't business owners who are listening? What did he mean by that? Well, uh, I mean, you know, you got to have enough cash uh, to pay the bills, right? And the flow of cash in and out of your organization. Uh, can can run at different speeds. So, particularly in a growth phase, firms struggle with this because you're you're really you're spending more money to make money. Um, but unfortunately, particularly in the world of architecture, you know you don't get paid the minute you provide the service. Right? There's a there's a there's a gap there. Um, in manufacturing, you call it a cash gap of when you have to pay your your employees and your vendors to the time that you get paid from your customer. How much cash is in that system and and you really have to manage the flow of cash through that system so that you have the, the cash to pay your bills and pay your employees and, and grow your business. And there's always going to be cash wrapped up in receivables from your customers. Uh, you know, we saw in 2008, 2009, the, the days it took those average customers to pay their bills just skyrocketed, right? We all saw projects go on hold. We saw them close. Uh, we had all, tons of projects we didn't get paid for. And the cash dried up very, very fast. So... You know, I think that's what he meant was uh, per particularly after those years, you know, nobody's going to take their eye off of cash flow again. Uh, and, you know, he didn't understand that, that was such an important issue in the, in the beginning. Did he, t did he mention any strategies that he's been able to implement to cope with that? Or did you guys discuss anything yeah. like that? Uh, he just, he said, he, he did say one thing, just that every single hiring is critical. You can't have weak people on your staff. That was his quote. Mm -hmm. And I think what he means by that is if you, if you think of it from a cash flow perspective is, you know, every bad hire costs me tons, right? Because I spend all the money in the front end when they're not producing and, and I'm spending time and money on that hire. Uh, even operational people who are, who are not revenue producing, but you're relying on them to bring value to the firm. Uh, if you make a bad decision during the hiring process, then that's going to start all over. And that's just a, a really expensive exercise. So that, that was one example he gave me. I'm sure he, he could have talked all day about this. He's been through, he's been through some battles. He was kind of a seasoned veteran. And uh, you know anybody that owned a firm through 2007, 8, 9, and 10, you know, they, they've got battle wounds to talk about these issues. Absolutely. What else do you have on your list there? Uh, you know, one, one business development strategy that I found was interesting was a firm that's just very deeply involved in their community. And uh, among six employees, they're involved in 26 community organizations. So their whole business development strategy is to serve on boards and serve community, you know, uh, committees and a whole variety of different um, organizations throughout their community. And that's the way they build their network. And that's the way they ultimately drive business to their firm. Um, I've, I've heard, certainly heard firms talk about the importance of being involved in the community and I've heard partners talk about, you know, the, the different circles that they, you know, that they're involved in as, as a way to bring business, but I had never heard it, you know, really that intentional. I mean, that is, that is their sole focus for business development and I thought that was very interesting. It is. Um, you know, I, I asked the question about culture quite a bit and I've heard you know, everything from, uh, we sing happy birthday, uh, the whole office sings happy birthday to anybody who's celebrating a birthday to, you know, um, different kinds of outings and, you know, company events, things to try to keep people very positive and happy. Um, there's all, all kinds of different strategies to, to build culture. And, and clearly what's crazy is that the narrative that I would hear from a lot of firms was very consistent about collaboration and relationship and process and, you know, uh, good design. I've heard that, you know, the word good, the words good design repeated over and over and over. But even, even though the narratives seem to be very consistent, the cultures of these firms are very different. I mean, everyone 
seems to have had its own type of personality, all driven, of course, by the by the owners. Um, but it's just been interesting how you know the the mission statement on the wall might say uh, one thing, but the culture might not might not oppose the mission statement. It just has its own unique flavor. What's your takeaway from that? Well, as we talked about in the last episode, it's it's. Um, just the advice to, that you be be intentional about that. I mean, mm -hmm. your culture is going to get defined, whether you define it or somebody else does. You, you're going to have a culture inside your firm. So, you know, I would I would encourage firm owners and to uh, to be intentional about that, to spend a lot of time thinking about it, and to and to engage their employees in, in defining it and um, and working towards making sure that you're you're living it. I would also add, you know. Um, I think Matt and I both believe that you, you've got to re-examine that pretty regularly and you've got to have people who are willing to come forward and say, this isn't consistent with who we are, right? This is, we need to be doing something differently here um, and have those kinds of discussions. Otherwise, you know, if you're not revisiting that uh, pretty regularly, um, the culture will shift and, and be something different. Interesting. Any other any other takeaways on your list there that jump out at you? Well, there's uh, I think we're at a little more than fifty uh, interviews so far. There, there's uh, what's interesting is the different some of the different ownership models that are mm -hmm. out there. Some you know some believe wholeheartedly that they want to be fifty fifty partners or thirty three thirty three thirty three, and then others say that they're happy sharing equity with others in the firm, but they're not giving up more than 51% because they want to be the decision maker. And I, I'm not sure, I can't really draw a conclusion of whether there's, you know, a, a recommended model there. Uh, I, I do say from my own personal experience, a 50-50 partnership always kind of worries me because, you know, even though, I mean, things always start out positive and we're going to work it out, but, you know, you're always at the risk that, you're not going to agree and that that disagreement is going to have a, a real impact on the firm. Um, so it's just, it is interesting to be a lot of different approaches to, to building equity. The other thing I would say that is pretty common is clearly a lot of firms out there are thinking about succession planning and transitioning ownership and retirement. It is without any question, it is a big topic out there that a lot of firms are struggling with. And in terms of handling that, um, anything interesting that you're uncovering of firms either handling that or, or perhaps not being as prepared as they'd like? Yeah, I haven't gotten, uh, have not gotten into the depth of, you know, of looking at these transition agreements or equity agreements that uh, partners are having with their employees. I just haven't, you know, I'm still developing trust and uh, building these relationships and I haven't felt comfortable asking to kind of review that yet. But um, but many firms are using outside counsel to really help them with this issue. Um, some of them are using a CPA firm, some of them a law firm, uh, some of them just a, a standard consulting firm. And there's a lot of fine firms out there in all three categories that can help small to mid-sized firms with that with that uh, issue. Um, but it, it takes a whole range of, of models. I mean, uh, one firm, uh, the firm is basically willed to two other partners, and that, that was it. That was the transition plan. Um, Another one is, you know, allowing new partners to gradually buy in and buy out the old partners. And uh, there's just a lot of different models out there. I don't, sorry, I don't have the, you know, the advice on what works best just yet. Uh, I'm sure there's some out there that may not work as well as, as you think they do. But um, maybe we'll do a follow-up podcast after a year of this and I'll have a little more insight into the best plan for transition. That would be great, Todd. So we've touched on some of the challenges that you're finding as you're as you're getting immersed in the industry. You, shall we switch over now to some of the best practices that you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So, you know, I, I think and again I'm really focusing in on that on that space of the four to five employee firm that really wants to be a ten to fifteen employee firm. And if you think about that from a revenue perspective, you're really thinking about somewhere in the, you know, half a million dollars a year in annual revenue to growing up to the two to three million dollars a year in annual revenue. And you know, the literature that we read and the research that we that we look over has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, key performance indicators that you can you can look at. Um, 
And so we're trying to understand those and apply those to that smaller firm. Do they really apply? You know, does a 60 to 70 percent utilization rate, is that really true for a four or five person firm? <laughs> Most of the ones I ask, they say 60 to 70. We're all at 120 right now. You know, call us later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, whether, whether you can start to apply some of those KPIs at the smaller level or not is, is an interesting question and we're still trying to examine that. Um, I think certainly best practice is to go back to the hiring situation. I mean, hiring good talent, bringing good talent into your firm, making them feel engaged and a part of the, part of the culture um, is critical to growth. Todd, just one thing before we go on. I realize we kind of glossed over the utilization rate and... Um, many people might not exactly know what that is. Could you describe what that means and why a smaller firm might have a higher utilization rate than a larger firm? Right. So um, I, I would uh, certainly encourage anybody that hasn't read Rena Klein's um, book, uh, highly recommend it. It has great um, definitions of all of these key performance indicators in there. And Rena is a great, a great expert in this area. Uh, but utilization rate is just you know how much of the of the billable hour of the employee are you able to bill for? Um, you know if you if they're working forty hours a week, are you actually billing for sixty to seventy percent of that forty hours uh, every week? And um, you know sixty they're always going to have hours that they do something that is not billable. So in a smaller firm, you know when it's it's in many instances it's a husband wife firm or it's a or it's equal partner firm, you know, right now many of the ones I talk to are very busy, very active, and they feel like they're billing for every hour they're working, um, mm -hmm. which may or may not be true. Uh, in, in some cases, they don't track it quite as carefully so that you can start running calculations, but, um, but they, they feel like they're, you know, well over 60 or 70 percent because they're working a lot of hours in the week. All right, thank you. And then you talked about the firm culture. Any other best practices that are that come to mind? Well, um, I'll tell you one. You know, I don't know if this is a best practice, but certainly uh, some of the some of the topics that we've covered in these interviews are really about market focus and whether whether your firm is a firm that's going to be specialized in one specific area or you want to have a develop a broad portfolio. Most of the firms that I talk to that are larger, you know, 20, 20 architects maybe and, and more, you know, they really talk about the strength of a, of a very diverse portfolio. Um, that when one market contracts, they have, a, you know, some good work in another market, they're able to really um, kind of flex that muscle and invest in that uh, going forward. So, you know, I, I don't have a, a real good answer for that four to five person firm, um, but I would be careful about too narrow of a focus, right? Um, uh, having said that, I also had one firm tell me that, you know, every project you take on becomes a part of your DNA was, was their statement to me. Uh, so they, they were very um, specific about if, if they did some work that they felt like was not consistent with who they are because they wanted to pay the bills, so to speak, um, they, did not, they do not add that project to their website. They do not add it to their portfolio. You know, they try to really put forward the work that they feel is who they are, and if they take on something else, they, you know, they kind of they, they get it done certainly, but they, uh, but they don't, um, you know, they don't promote that that type of work because they want to have a portfolio that is more specific. So, you know, that's certainly a topic that we've been we've been interested in and learning about about how specific you get in your marketplace. Interesting. Any others that come to mind? That's, I mean, uh, you know, there's certainly more lessons I can find in, you know, how, how you bring on new talent and when you bring on new talent. Um, that's certainly been a topic that a lot of firms have struggled with. Uh, you know, they, it's the chicken and the egg. They all say, you know, I, 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 we're busy right now. Um, I'm not sure I could keep another full-time architect busy, so I'm going to contract until I get to a point that I think I can you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a really good contract relationship that can kind of sit and wait until you're ready to bring them on salary, then then, then great. Um, more more than not, you know, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily work because the person wants a salary job or they have other relationships that they want to continue to contract for. Um, but that that's uh, uh, certainly an issue of how and when you bring on 
uh, new talent to help support the growth of the business. And then to go back to what we said in the beginning of this conversation, how do you really manage cash flow uh, through that through that process? Those are you know very important issues to think about. So, do you have any answers to any of these questions yet? Or are you still researching and and withholding? Yeah, final judgment. I think, yeah, I think I think um, the the first answer to that is you know I'm always real careful to apply one model to every firm, right? I mean, every firm is different. Um, their experience level is different. Their capital position is different. And so, you know, I would say, yeah, I'm, I don't have a single answer right now. I think. You know, we're at a point where we should be able to sit down with, with owners of these types of firms, listen to their story more, understand kind of where they are, and be able to advise them in a, in a way that, uh, that can have an impact on their business. But it's certainly advice that would be customized to that firm, certainly based on what we're learning, but, um, but not one answer for, for all firms. I wish, I wish it were that easy. We, uh, we, we, we would prefer that, you know, but it's, it's just not the, not the real world. Yeah. yeah. Todd, I'm sure there's some listeners listening to this that think, you know what, I would love to chat with Todd. I probably have some things that I could share about my own personal experience. Where would they go to get a hold of you to initiate that conversation? Yeah, I would love to talk with, you know, any of these small to mid-sized firms that would be willing to spend half an hour, 45 minutes with me on the phone, just telling me your story. So please go to our website, which is, uh, which is www.charette, C-H-A-R-R-E-T-T, V is in Victor, G is in George, dot com. So that stands for Charette Venture Group, of course. Um, CharetteVG.com. My contact information is on there, but my email address is very simple. It's Todd, T-O-D-D, at CharetteVG.com. Drop me an email anytime and tell me if there would be a convenient time to talk and would love to spend some time getting to know as, as many uh, our architects is will take the time to talk to me. Excellent. And if you just get one of my emails and you reply to it, I can forward that request on to Todd just in case you're listening right now and you don't have something to write down and you don't want to go back and get the contact details. So be happy to do that. Todd, the, the business plan competition that you that your firm launched last year uh, closed the applications on February 3rd, I believe. So you guys that's are correct. now, tell me about the process, how that's going. Let our listeners know what that's about. Yeah, so um, we're, we're thrilled to be doing this again. Uh, it's our second year. Uh, last year uh, was, was a great success, more uh, registrants and applicants than we, than we thought would be there. Um, but we have closed registrations uh, this year. And we had more than 100, about, I think it's about 106 uh, people actually registered. And so now they have until March 5th to, uh, to complete an executive summary and take a short video um, and that kind of summarizes their plan. And, um, and then uh, by March 5th, they'll submit that. And then from that group, we have four jurors who will go through that material and select uh, our finalists. And I'm going to, while I've got you on here, I'm going to pull up this timeline and make sure I get my dates correct. Um, give me just one second. So uh, they have until March 3rd to submit their three-page outline in the video. And then we'll notify the finalists uh, between March 18th and March 20th. And we'll do a public announcement of the finalists uh, on March 23rd. Last year, we selected six finalists. And then uh, the deadline for the finalists to submit their full business plan is April 27th. And then uh, on May 13th in Atlanta, uh, we provide a stipend to bring the finalists to Atlanta, where the National AIA Convention will be held uh, this May. Uh, they'll present their business plan to our jury. A physical presentation, they stand up and, and talk through the plan, and the jurors can ask questions and so forth. And then on the 14th of May, we have a special reception uh, where uh, all of the finalists will be present. Many of the people who have helped promote the, the competition, many of our family and friends who have been involved with the Charette Venture Group will be at the reception, and we will announce uh, the winners, uh, and particularly the winner of the $10,000 grand prize at that reception. Well, we look forward here on Business of Architecture to you know, letting people know who the winners are, letting them know how the yeah. process went, you know, we look forward to getting that information from you when you release that press release about how this is going, spreading the yeah, word. Yeah, absolutely. About that. And I think, 
I think you you interviewed our finalists from last year, I think, on your podcast, right? And had some good yeah, discussions. Yeah, I had Catherine Darnstead on. Awesome, yeah. passionate woman from Chicago. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, so, yeah, it was very good. And she was the second place winner. Um, the first place was the guy from uh, from Austin. We had him yes. on. He was talking about yeah. um, some prefabricated, you know, dwelling units that was very, very interesting. And then we had uh, Ryan Hansanyawat, who was a finalist, talk about his. So, yeah, hopefully we can get your finalists on the show again to tell the world about what so. they're doing. Yeah, I hope so. There's some there's some fascinating people doing awesome things. You're, uh, you know, from our, our side, um, Todd, I'm just going to speak for myself and other architects. It's, it's great to have someone like yourself coming in here with the passion, the experience that you have, bringing that into our industry, because heaven knows we need it. And, uh, you know, we look forward to learning from your efforts. And, and that's part of that's why I'm doing this show also. Well, thanks. It's, it's an honor to, to be involved in this and uh, we're having a lot of fun. Now, you guys also have uh, an accelerator program that you talked about. Could you tell me what that's about? Yeah, so we're doing the the first accelerator program. We'll kind of wrap up this spring. We started it last fall. Uh, we invited 21 firms to be a part of it. Uh, they meet uh, every other week for roughly an hour, um, and we bring in guest speakers to talk through uh, finance, um, marketing, leadership, management. Actually, I mentioned Rena Klein. Rena is going to be doing uh, some episodes on some of those KPIs and best best practices that she's written about in her book. Uh, and so it's just an opportunity for this group to come together, you know, talk through best practices across the board from, you know, wide range of issues from finance to marketing to, you know, just growing their firms. And uh, they participate in a LinkedIn group, uh, a closed LinkedIn group that they can all share their notes and ideas of how they're growing their business. Um, and so that will conclude uh, later this spring. And we're still working on our plans for our second accelerator group that will start uh, probably September uh, of this year, and you know we're really talking with this year's participants to talk about how we can improve it. What can we do to really, uh, really build the strength of that of that program? And the whole purpose of that is to help these firms grow, but it's also to give us that direct relationship with firms that we may, uh, you know, that we may have an interest in investing in, and that may have an interest in getting to know us more. So. When you, you mentioned investing in firms, I know we talked a little bit about that previously, but help my mind get wrapped around that. My audience, are we talking about yeah. um, security, some sort of security that, that private investors would invest in that was basically tied to the performance of a firm? What does that yeah. look like? It's a great question. And, and, you know, as I said in our last episode, we're still, we're still figuring out what that really looks like. But, um, you know, I think every firm is going to have a different set of needs. Uh, but we hope to bring uh, some some resources uh, in terms of, of services. We might be able to help a firm with business development, with marketing, with uh, with strategic planning. Uh, certainly, capital is is one piece of the puzzle. But we want to we we're not a consulting company, and we want to do more than just you know just put cash into the business. We want to come in and really help a business that's interested in growth. Really help move them uh, move them forward, and so. You know, I, I don't know exactly what that picture looks like, but it will be it would be a, a comprehensive picture uh, that would involve a variety of different pieces um, that would that that they need the most to kind of get them over to that next level. So, no, we're not a licensed uh, we're not a licensed venture firm that, that's raising a fund, so to speak. Right now, this is all self funded, and um, that's kind of the way we're we're planning it right now. And what is it like to sit in on one of these accelerator? Uh, sessions yeah um, we use go to meeting and uh, we have you know we have the video window up and we walk through some type of a presentation uh, actually Matt Ostenek presented on uh, on business development best practices the last time and kind of talk through the audience uh, they're able to ask questions at any point they can they can type in the chat window or they can unmute the mic and, and ask a question and then we record this, this session and put it in that LinkedIn group so that those that couldn't participate can come back and listen to it, and they can all continue to talk about it within that platform. We did. We also did some one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, in the fall. A uh, member of our team whose expertise is really marketing kind of talked with them about um, marketing practices. What is their marketing? What is their message? Um, just to kind of help answer questions and help them shape some vision around that. 
Um, we've got a lot of really positive feedback about that. I have uh, contacted each member of the Accelerator Group and done one of these interviews with them, uh, just talking about the history of their firm and using that information in my study. Um, so that's it's kind of it's kind of a combination of that. Every other week, get together as a group, listen about a topic, along with you know some real personal one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. What are the members of this group? What are they? Are they giving you feedback on the things that are impressing them the most, or helping them the most, or the big ahas that they're having? Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of it are, are things that we've already talked about. I mean, many of them are very normal, you know, small firms. Just some of them, some of them just getting started, um, and and they're confronting all those common challenges that we all know. Like, how do I grow it? How do I run it? You know, I want to design. Um, and uh, it's it's fun to watch them. You know, they're in that really what I think is that fun uh, beginning stage. But it's also one of the stages that you, of, a, of a company's life cycle that you you know you have to make a lot of really important decisions. You're kind of doing everything, right? There's there's no CFO, there's no director of operations, there's no you know this it's you. So uh, that's both fun and nerve wracking, uh, and I see that in, in those firms. But they're a group of amazing people, really, really incredible firms that are that are, I'm convinced, are going to be around for a long time. Todd, you and Matt have been very intentional about this process of Shred Venture Group and the way you're approaching this process. Where do you see yourselves, hopefully, in five years down the line? Mm, good question. Well, we'd like to create a model that's scalable. You know, once we get what I would say, let's say, good at this, right? We we know really what we're doing. We're able to take that base of knowledge, pretty quickly identify firms that we think fit with us, and pretty quickly develop a high level of trust of the firm in us, and then we're able to grow it. You know, we would like to bring in more people like myself. And and scale it. Uh, I mean, our numbers show that there could be sixty thousand firms under ten people in the United States, the UK, and uh, in Canada. So the market is vast, and uh, we would like to begin to replicate that so that you've got you know five, ten, fifteen uh, people that are representatives of our firm working with a portfolio of architecture firms to help them make that move to the larger space. And really develop a, a good, solid, healthy practice. I should be should be clear. I mean, we we see this as a very long term plan. This is not a, a five year play. So what I'm describing for you might make might take twenty years to get to. But um, but that's our vision. Excellent. Is there and just a final follow up question, Todd? Is there any pushback from architects so that you're fine? I guess it's it's hard to phrase this question. But what I'm getting at here is that uh, a lot of designers, architects, like you mentioned, we we came into this because we wanted to do something impactful in the world. You know, we didn't necessarily do it just because we wanted to make a lot of money. So approaching, mm -hmm. you know, are there any difficulties merging sort of a venture mindset with that mindset? Any challenges that you see there or that you're already starting to see? Yeah, that's a great question. And I have heard that uh, a number of times. And so, you know, I don't know if that means that you're not the right firm for us or if that means that we just have to come to a clear understanding of what that growth looks like, you know, that you're not seeking to take on any project you want to get to $3 million in revenue. That, I get that. That's, that's not necessarily what we would advise anyway. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that that's, that's yet, to be, yet to be determined of whether that is a disqualifier. Um, I, I think if you're a firm that you're three or four architects strong and that's that's all you want to do and you don't want to invest in business development and you, you're not really interested in marketing, you're perfectly happy with uh, the RFP process and if your website, you haven't touched it in three years and, and you think that that's okay, then you know then that it's probably not going to be a really good fit with, with our model. You meant and 13 years, right, Todd? 13, say that again? Yeah, I said you meant 13 years, right? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's we're going to find some critical characteristics that are consistent with a firm that can grow. Um, I don't think it means that you, as the owner of the firm, have to be uh, consumed with growth and consumed with making money at all. As a matter of fact, I think, you know, we can help you be a stronger firm and have more of an impact on the world if you're running a good, efficient, healthy business. And so, you know, uh, I, I think that, that we can find common, uh, common grounds with, 
people that want to change the world because that's kind of why we're in this anyway. Excellent. So, and have you guys made any sort of plan to address the idea of people being hesitant to be involved because of the negative stereotypes? You always hear about the Wall Street firms, you know, right. putting so much pressure on the firms they invest in. Man, I'm just doing this for, for Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. Matt and I have both dealt with investors uh, in the past. So, I mean, we, we kind of know, we know what, the, what that world can be like. And um, I would say, you know, we're definitely in this to, as you are, to impact the lives of, of architecture firms. That, I mean, that is our, our guiding principle. Um, I think if you spent 15 minutes with Matt and I, uh, you know, you'd, you'd understand pretty quickly that we're not Wall Street venture capitalists. Um, we live in Iowa. <laughs> we, <laughs> we're pretty, we're pretty, uh, you know, we're pretty normal guys that um, are just looking to do a good job. Excellent. Well, Todd, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I'll leave a minute here for, at the end. If you have any call to action or anything you'd like to invite our listeners to do to find out more about uh, Charette Venture Group and your efforts, I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. That's the first thing, Enoch. I really appreciate it. I've really appreciated your podcast. It's such such common parallel goals, and we applaud everything you're doing and want to do anything we can to help you succeed as well. Um, anybody that's interested in what we're doing, uh, give you the website, charettebg.com. Um, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Uh, uh, keep an eye on our uh, architecture business plan competition. I think some really exciting uh, things are going to come out of that. And we will be running that competition next year. We have every intention of making this an annual uh, competition. Uh, there is a $10,000 grand prize. There is no fee to enter. So I uh, encourage everybody to keep an eye out on that next year. If you have a firm you're thinking of starting or you've started it and it's less than five or ten years old, uh, check, check out the competition uh, next year. And again, please reach out to me if I can be of any help or if you'd be willing to talk with me about your firm. I'd love to hear from you. Excellent. That, that website is architecturebusinessplancompetition.com. Correct. I it believe. ties into the same, the same website. Uh, it ties into the competition page of our, of our main site. But yes, yeah, see, if you want to go to the competition page, you can go to architecturebusinessplancompetition.com. And is there a place that people can sign up there for notifications about the future competitions? Actually, probably the best way to do that is to send me an email. We don't have a newsletter sign up on that or an email sign up. But if you send me an email and would like to stay in touch, I certainly can, can take care of that. We do have a news portion of that, and we, we are considering a blog, although we're, we're hesitant to do that until we're fully committed to you know, making that a regular part of our, of our structure. Mm. Uh, but if you just reach out to me, I'll make sure we keep you posted on what's going on. Excellent. Well, thanks. Thanks, Todd, for being on the show. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.